Good afternoon, everyone. I'm pleased to welcome you to this exciting event of the Center for Security Policy Studies at George Mason University. Uh, CSPS is one of several research centers at the Shar School of Policy and Government that examine diverse aspects of the security agenda. And this is why our security programs are highly ranked in drawing students from all over the country and from abroad. The Center for Security Policy Studies organizes and hosts events as well as student-led activities such as crisis simulations. Our next simulation is going to be in late April, by the way. And today's topic addresses an emerging issue in national security policy deliberations. How could advances in drone technology further complicate defenses against chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear attacks? So we have a great panel to explore these issues. I'm happy to pass the virtual mic to Ellen Leibson, who directs the Center for Security Policy Studies. And she's gonna to moderate today's discussion and also introduce our speakers. Ellen. Thank you so much, Dean Roselle, and welcome to everyone on this topic that I think has garnered a lot of interest. So we've all watched the emergence of drones as a almost ubiquitous technology from Amazon delivering packages, et cetera. But the military and security applications of drones really do require a lot of serious study and consideration. So today we're gonna to be looking at uh, drones and the CBRN cluster of, of challenges, both who's using them uh, and how might they use them in an offensive way, but in particular as well, what are possible defenses? How is the US government and the US you know, thinking world, uh, policy thinking world, uh, thinking through the challenges and the dilemmas of drones that could further um, co complicate how we protect ourselves against uh, chem, bio, radiological and nuclear threats. So um, today we're going to have three wonderful speakers. Each will speak for 10 plus, 10, 12 minutes, uh, and then we'll open to a discussion among the three of them. We'll see if they want to challenge each other a little bit, and then we'll open it to uh, our audience for some uh, questions and comments. I would ask you to please put any question or comment that you want raised in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. So first, let me quickly introduce, we have longer bios available to you uh, online, but I'm delighted to welcome my colleague, Greg Koblenz, Associate Professor and Director of the Biodefense Program at George Mason. He has been working on nuclear and biological threats uh, and runs, as I said, our biodefense program. Uh, Professor Koblenz will speak first. We'll then turn uh, to Zach Kellenborn, who is now affiliated with our Center for Security Policy Studies. And he's also a research affiliate with the Unconventional Weapons and Technology uh, Division of the uh, group that studies terrorism at the University of Maryland. The US Army has proclaimed him a mad scientist, which we are quite intrigued by. Uh, so uh, Zach will talk about his work on drone swarms and, and other uh, cluster of issues related to drones. And we're really delighted to have Nicole Thomas join us. She is the Deputy Chief for Strategy and Policy at the Joint Counter Small Unmanned Aircraft Systems Office in the Department of Defense. She graduated from the Army War College, and she will give us perhaps a broader perspective on how some of these issues fit into the work that her office does on small unmanned aircraft. So um, Greg, uh, I think you're up first, so um, we'll look forward to your remarks. Great, thank you, Ellen. Uh, really glad to be here with everybody today. Uh, and nice to see so many people have uh, tuned in uh, despite the really nice weather and the uh, temptation to go outside and enjoy that. Uh, so we'll try and make it worth your while. Um, so I'm uh, gonna be talking about drones in the future of, of CBR and terrorism. And uh, uh, you know, th this is not necessarily a new topic, uh, in 2016, at a summit, uh, a nuclear security summit, 50 world leaders gathered uh, and, it, and uh, conducted a crisis simulation involving a uh, radiological terrorist attack conducted by uh, a drone. Uh, and even though this was a fictional scenario, uh, it embodied um, you know, threats and technologies that uh, are, are very much a, a reality now and have implications for the ability of terrorist groups to use uh, chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear weapons. And this threat is enabled by the fact that drones are now uh, 
maybe not quite ubiquitous, but they are uh, multiplying uh, ever more um, quickly in terms of both numbers and capabilities and applications uh, throughout the civilian sector. Uh, and so the, uh, the market now for uh, drones globally is expected to climb to $30 billion uh, in about four years or so. Uh, and so we can expect this trend to continue, if not um, accelerate. Uh, and uh, the, the drones that have you know, emerged and the ones that I'll be, I'll be talking about have applications in the areas of um, you know, consumer and commercial imagery, cargo delivery, and in agriculture. And uh, the risks that uh, we have to worry about is the fact that these commercial off-the-shelf systems with little to no modification uh, can be used to provide unprecedented means for uh, non-state actors to gather intelligence and attack targets um, that could release chemical, biological, uh, or radiological uh, materials in, in unconventional ways. And so today I'm going to briefly discuss three ways that drones can enable CBR and terrorism. Uh, the first is the role of um, drones to uh, conduct intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance on potential targets. Uh, next, the role of drones as basically flying IEDs when uh, equipped with uh, explosive weapons to attack critical infrastructure targets that contain large quantities of chemical, biological, or radiological materials. Uh, and then finally, uh, the risk posed by drones serving as delivery systems to directly use uh, chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear weapons uh, against the target. Uh, and I will just note that this, uh, this talk is based on an article that uh, came out um, last summer that in itself is based on a talk I gave to the UN Security Council in 2016 on the threats of emerging uh, technologies uh, and the impact on the ability of non-state actors to acquire and use um, weapons of mass destruction. So first, looking at the role of uh, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance, uh, there's already quite a, uh, a record of terrorist groups and insurgent groups using drones to gather intelligence on high security areas. And one of the real advantages that, that drones bring to this is their ability to uh, circumvent ground-based defenses that are the, the primary means of security for these types of, of facilities and their ability to loiter over long periods of time over such targets to gather uh, you know, high quality uh, intelligence. Uh, and traditionally this has been done using um, you know, visual uh, imagery and, and cameras, but there are now more advanced drones that are available commercially that have uh, thermal imaging uh, and infrared capabilities so they can operate um, at night uh, as well. Uh, and this kind of intelligence gathering can provide uh, really useful insights into uh, not just the layout uh, of a facility uh, internally, uh, but also the, uh, the practices and, and capabilities of any security forces that are operating uh, at the facility. Uh, we know of at least five uh, terrorist groups, including Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic State, the Taliban, and HTS, that have used drones for this purpose. Uh, and in fact, they make this part of their propaganda, as you can see here from uh, the imagery that the Islamic State and Hezbollah uh, have released to demonstrate their ability to gather information on otherwise inaccessible targets. And we've also seen several cases of uh, unidentified operators uh, using drones to penetrate secure, uh, restricted areas over secure and sensitive sites. Uh, so for example, there were a series of cases, both in the United States and France, of unidentified drones uh, in very close proximity to nuclear power plants uh, for unknown reasons. And in uh, 2016, an unidentified drone flew over the Bangor uh, Naval Base, which is home to eight of the United States' um, tried and ballistic missile submarines, as well as over 1,300 nuclear warheads, uh, which is the, the largest nuclear uh, weapon stockpile in the United States. Uh, and since these sites are surrounded by fences and gates and uh, guarded patrols, uh, the ability of these drones to um, fly over all of those security precautions um, provided a unique means for whoever is operating these drones to gather information about uh, the internal layout of these facilities, the configuration, and the uh, security practices uh, inside. Uh, another uh, application of these um, uh, of these drones, uh, and, and this is a, real, a newer trend, but one that has been uh, kind of widely uh, copied. Uh, is uh, weaponizing drones, either um, weaponizing commercially available off-the-shelf drones or, or uh, groups building their own uh, to either uh, use a, in a kamikaze uh, tactic or dropping uh, small munitions on a target. And, and we've seen uh, groups including Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, the Islamic State, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, uh, develop these types of, of drone-based uh, weapons to uh, attack their targets. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the major disadvantages of uh, 
using a, a drone in this way right, is the relatively small payload uh, that the drone can carry. Um, drones that are um, commonly available for, for consumer use have a payload of only a few kilograms. There are more kind of commercial grade, professional grade drones that have uh, payloads in maybe the dozens of kilograms, uh, but there are models that are uh, being developed that carry even heavier um, payloads. Uh, however, these drones do the advantage of being able to be turned into uh, precision guided munitions, basically, uh, based on either the, the onboard camera that can be used to target a, a drone directly onto a, a specific aim point, or the use of uh, precision guidance uh, through GPS uh, that can allow the drone to uh, attack a target in a very specific location. Uh, in addition, uh, again, the, the drone has the, the somewhat unique ability to circumvent ground-based defenses and attack specific targets inside of a secure compound. Uh, and the vulnerability of otherwise secure facilities to this kind of tactic was revealed in 2015 when a, a drone accidentally crashed into the grounds of the White House. Uh, but that was just an illustration of the ability of these kinds of vehicles to enter uh, otherwise restricted and heavily controlled areas. Uh, now, there's a way for uh, terrorist groups to compensate for the small payload on these, uh, on these drones. Uh, and the example you see here on um, the right uh, of an ISIS drone equipped with a uh, high explosive anti-tank grenade, which is designed to, to punch through uh, the heavy armor of a tank. Uh, this kind of um, uh, shape charge or explosively formed projectile uh, is relatively uh, small and it can be carried by uh, you know, relatively small drones. And that does provide enough firepower to punch through uh, a storage tank that contains toxic industrial chemicals. Um, uh, using just one drone in this way, though, probably won't be sufficient to cause a uh, disruption of a, a site that stores toxic industrial chemicals or a nuclear power plant spent fuel ponds or high biocontainment facilities, uh, because these sites are designed to withstand natural events such as tornadoes, hurricanes, and earthquakes. Um, and they tend to have redundant safety systems to prevent a, a catastrophic release of a dangerous material in the event of some kind of, of accident or, or security breach. Um, in addition, uh, being able to uh, use these drones to uh, release uh, large quantities of a hazardous material would probably also require a fairly detailed understanding about the operations of the facility and its weak points. Uh, that being said, uh, the, the uh, possibility of using swarms of drones to attack multiple sensitive points uh, in a facility uh, simultaneously uh, does create a, a, a considerable risk that a group would be able to uh, neutralize or, or circumvent or mitigate uh, some of the backup systems that are uh, at these facilities uh, and would normally prevent that kind of release of, of a dangerous, uh, dangerous material. Uh, finally, uh, commercial off-the-shelf drones uh, could one day serve as, as a poor man's cruise missile to deliver a, a weapon of mass destruction. Uh, nuclear weapons will remain you know, too large and, and bulky for delivery by any of the kind of drones that a Nazi actor could either build or, um, or, or buy um, themselves. Uh, but uh, some of the other CBRN agents uh, are um, more suitable for delivery by, by drones. Uh, probably the, the most um, suitable would be uh, the delivery of chemical and biological agents because it uh, requires a very small payload uh, to have a, a very large effect. And the, the low speed, um, low altitude uh, flight profile of, of these drones is, is very well suited for dis disseminating chemical and biological agents uh, on top of a target. Uh, and uh, there are actual drones that are already equipped to spray pesticides uh, on, on fields. And these are become increasingly common, increasingly capable. Um, there are even designs online to build your own sprayer drone for just a few thousand dollars. Uh, these commercially available drones can carry uh, upwards of 20 to 30 liters of pesticides or of sarin. Uh, and it's worth remembering that the uh, Om Shinrikyo group use only six to seven liters of sarin uh, to kill 11 people and injure over a thousand commuters on the Tokyo subway system in March, 1995. So even a small quantity of, of a potent nerve agent can cause uh, you know, really massive um, casualties if delivered effectively. Uh, uh, there are also um, uh, the potential for delivery of biological agents um, uh, by unmanned aerial vehicles. However, dissemination mechanisms for uh, biological agents are different than for chemical agents. So you need a, a more specialized uh, dissemination um, device. Uh, and those are commercially available, but they would need to be integrated into the drone 
to turn the drone into a flying biological weapon, which would be more, more challenging. However, biological agents that don't require aerosolization for dissemination, such as certain uh, animal and plant pathogens, could be more easily delivered by a drone. Uh, in fact, we have a case um, from just um, about a year and a half ago uh, in, in China where the reports of um, uh, gangs using drones to deliver uh, material infected with African swine fever onto pig farms in China. Uh, and this was not terrorism, this was not bioterrorism, but this was a, a biocrime because these gangs would um, then buy the contaminated uh, uh, pigs from these farmers uh, for at a very cheap rate, but then go on to the black market and resell it at a higher rate as, as healthy meat. So this was a, a, a biocrime episode, but it does demonstrate the, um, unfortunately, the creativity of Nazi actors to use drones for these different purposes. And it's worth noting that African swine fever is considered a select agent in the United States because that disease does not occur naturally in the United States. And any outbreak of African swine fever would have um, catastrophic consequences for our pork industry uh, in the US. Uh, finally, there is one known case of a um, radiological incident involving a drone. Uh, and this occurred in 2015 uh, when a, uh, an anti-nuclear activist uh, flew a drone containing a, a small amount of slightly radioactive soil uh, onto the roof of the Japanese prime minister's um, office in, in Tokyo. Uh, and so even though this was a, what wound up being a harmless political gesture, right, it very uh, graphically demonstrated the vulnerability of even uh, highly secure uh, buildings and compounds to these kinds of uh, aerial assault from above. And it also uh, highlighted the diversity of payloads that these kinds of drones can carry. And especially as more capable drones uh, for cargo delivery, such as those being developed by Amazon and DHL, become more widely available, that payload limitation will become less and less important. Uh, and at that point, really, it's only the ingenuity of the enunciate actor that will limit the application of the drone for um, uh, enabling or facilitating a CBR and terrorist attack. Uh, the, the final uh, point I, I want to make is that there are also um, uh, ways that drones can be used to improve our defenses against chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear weapons. And so there's um, some definite need for investments in uh, technologies that will enable uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, unmanned, uh, unmanned ground vehicles uh, to play a role in um, either preventing or defending against or responding to uh, a CBR and attack. Uh, and I've just highlighted a couple examples here on, on these slides. Um, and really, the, the, probably the, the most um, useful short-term application will be using unmanned um, aerial and, and ground vehicles for detection of chemical, biological, and radiological agents. Since most of the detectors that, that we have available uh, require to be in close proximity to the agent that they're detecting, uh, it makes a lot of sense to um, mount these on drones and fly these in potentially contaminated areas as a way of uh, you know, reducing the risk to, uh, to, to humans um, from, from doing that kind of operation. Uh, and then uh, with the ability for these, um, uh, these vehicles to, to loiter or be persistent, uh, it will enable them to map contaminated areas uh, to conduct you know, monitoring of the spread of contamination uh, and then track plumes that might be spreading downwind and feed that information back to first responders or the military in order for them to take defensive measures or to warn civilians in the area about uh, how the, the risk from this incident is, is changing. Uh, and the uh, uh, EU, for example, has developed uh, a suite of, of vehicles that are designed for conducting forensic work after a CBR incident, where they can go downrange of, of a, a CBR incident from either terrorist or, or criminal uh, intent to gather uh, evidence uh, and, and bring it back for analysis safely without endangering uh, human health. So there are a lot of opportunities here, I think, in the future for investments in science and technology uh, to um, leverage the, the capabilities that are offered by unmanned aerial vehicles to enhance our defenses against drones. And uh, hopefully we'll hear a little bit about that from, uh, um, uh, from our, our, our future speakers. Uh, so um, that's it. I will um, stop sharing my screen and turn things over to uh, Zach as the next speaker. Thanks, Greg. Uh, that was uh, quite excellent. So let me, where's the, you know, the Zoom thing is blocking the PowerPoint uh, ribbon. All right. All right. 
There we go. All right. So, yeah. So uh, thank you very much uh, for attending. Um, I'll just give the quick DC disclaimer that, uh, of course, these are all my own thoughts and don't represent uh, any of my current or former uh, employers, funders, affiliates, or anyone else, uh, just my own views. So uh, I'm going to be building a bit on Greg's comment um, by focusing on specifically the application of drone swarms and what they mean for CBR and uh, warfare. Um, so by drone swarms, I'm specifically referring to the ability of multiple drones to work together and collaborate to accomplish some uh, sort of shared task. Uh, and I realize that you know, when I bring up drone swarms, I think there's often like a sense of, oh, this is science fiction. This is, you know, the type of thing we see in like the Star Trek Beyond movie, whereas there's huge swarm of robot robots that sort of overwhelm and attack the Star Trek Enterprise and destroy everything. Um, like that's where we expect to see that sort of capability. And, you know, that's for not all that long ago, I thought that was pretty much the same thing. I didn't really think too much about it. Uh, but the reality is that drone swarms are already here. Uh, and What's more, they're likely to proliferate incredibly fast. So in 2016, uh, the US Strategic Capabilities Office launched 103 uh, Perdex drones. Those are the little orange ones you can see at the top right there. Um, out of three F-18 Super Hornets. These drones all collaborated together autonomously. They worked together. They formed into some various formations, as you can see, like in the bottom left. They moved across a uh, you know theoretical battlefield and then formed in some other formation. And they were doing all of this um, through a collect collective collaborative um, operation information sharing entirely autonomously. Now, what's even more important than the fact that there's a was a test, and this was five years ago, is who actually designed the system. So this Perdex drone was not created from like a Skunk Works type multi-million dollar R&D project where they're, or a Boeing type thing where you're designing like the next F-36 or F-23 or whatever. Um, rather, these systems were actually designed by students at MIT as part of a class project. Um, now, those, those are probably some of the smartest students like in the world, but they are nonetheless students. And it shows that you don't necessarily need that level of sophistication and capability to design some very sophisticated systems um, to actually carry out uh, these attacks. And what that suggests is that the uh, ability to proliferate, the, the likelihood of proliferation is quite high because you don't need that level of expertise. So just in the past like uh, six months to a year or so, there's been reports and announcements of new drone swarm related projects uh, from the United States, the United Kingdom, India, China, Spain, um, I believe South Africa, I think France announced a new one. Um, so and that's a very short amount of time. Now, these is not most of these are not for CBRN purposes. In fact, I'm not aware of any that are specific to CBRN. Uh, but nonetheless, you can see that the basic technology here is quite simple. Um, there's likely to be uh, quite a lot of movement in a very short amount of time. And I'll note just to connect a bit to uh, one of Greg's comments about uh, non-state actors that I think there is a very real risk here when it comes to non-state actors. Um, I'm not sure how much worry that is a short term, because even though these are simple, like they're from like an attack perspective, there's like quite a lot of integration that you need to do. And I suspect it's probably going to mostly remain in the domain of like the like higher levels, like an option Rikio type uh, thing. And it's possible you may have like a one-off small actor, but it seems at least at the moment, um, not as likely, but certainly is likely to grow over the future just given this level of um, simplicity. So drone swarms have applications really across like all aspects of warfare. And I think that's why you see this incredible uh, proliferation. Like uh, drone swarms can be useful for logistics in terms of like bringing supplies uh, to folks out in the battlefield. It can be useful for um, mounting bombs or guns onto them to carry out attacks. Uh, there's been some work on using um, basically swarms as smart munitions to serve in inside of like a missile warhead that releases like 48 or some odd drones that all work together. And of course, there's also extensive uh, applications across all aspects of offensive and defensive chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear warfare, which is, of course, what I'll be focusing on today. Um, and I think I'm going to be breaking it up a little bit. I'm first going to be talking a bit about the chem, bio, and radiological side, and then uh, uh, about the nuclear, because I think there are uh, distinct um, and significant applications. Um, at the moment, I, I'm going to be drawing some, some broader conclusions about uh, what, what this is likely to mean, like on balance uh, for broader CBRN warfare. Um, but I think because there's so many applications, I think it's probably more important just to explore and think more carefully about where, where are these applications and how do they mesh up? Because um, often I think imagination is a particularly important aspect uh, into uh, how these stack up. So for example, during World War II, uh, both France and Germany realized the importance of uh, a tank for military uh, uh, for militaries, but France used it primarily as an adjunct to uh, light infantry, whereas Germany designed their entire blitzkrieg 
blitzkrieg, uh, blitzkrieg strategy around it to significant effect. And so the, the importance of, of that means that like how these, these drone storms may be applicable in all sorts of ways that I'm not, or we're not even really considering at the moment. And so there's, uh, I think an important need to sort of um, explore and think carefully about what this all means. So let's dive into specifics. So I think when it comes to chemical, biological, and radiological uh, weapons, I think, again, you have applications for both offense and defense. But to me, I think the particularly imp impactful applications are around um, delivery delivery systems uh, for chem bio radi and radiological uh, weapons. So historically, we know that a huge challenge with these weapons is environmental factors, uh, where a, a bad wind might uh, blow a you know, gas, a, a cloud of sarin into a uh, bad area. And we, know that historically, for example, from the decision to, um, actually I would say in the 1960s or so, the U.S. tested, uh, I believe it was sarin gas in the, in the Dugway Proving Grounds in Utah. And it was like a nice little controlled area where you don't have any, uh, any anyone at risk, but a bad a bad wind ended up blow, blow, uh, blowing the cloud into a nearby farm and killing a whole bunch of sheep. Uh, got a bunch of media attention on 60 Minutes and it excited the passions of uh, some Congress folks who then launched a broad, helped launch a broader review of uh, the chemical and biological uh, weapons programs at the time, leading to a uh, end to the biological program, even though ironically it was a chemical weapon that uh, started. Uh, the point being here is that because these wind conditions, like these environmental factors are so big, that creates big challenges in terms of like the reliability of these weapons, which means if you can improve that, that can be quite significant. And drone swarms, I think, are likely to do that. Because when we've talked about a drone swarm, um, you can potentially integrate multiple different types of sensors, weapons, and other types of capabilities and have them all interact and, and support one another. So you could, for example, have a variety of um, environmental sensors that are monitoring wind conditions and then feeding that information to drones armed with uh, CBR uh, agents to better tailor and position the, their targeting. Alternatively, you can incorporate aspects of, say, machine vision to better recognize more precisely where the target is um, and have a higher likely to, likelihood of placing the agent on that particular target. Now, that's a really big issue because if we think his, um, think about the broader proliferation norms, those risks to civilians and the lack of ability is a big you know aspect of why we don't use these weapons anymore. So if you can improve that and that risk reduce, that potentially creates a, a real concern, especially at the same time where we're seeing uh, broader concerns over chem and uh, chemical norms, particularly around some of these open source reporting about uh, Russian use of uh, Novichok agents and various assassinations programs that Bellingcat recently um, released. And I think more than just uh, improving that delivery, there's all sorts of interesting and complex things that militaries can do if you have this sort of mixed complexity where you have different types of sensors, different types of armaments. So for example, what if you had a mixed chemical and conventional uh, armed swarm in which you have in which a military say uh, sprays a bunch of chemical agent on an adversary to force them into like the really restrictive uh, protective gear that like slows their movement and makes it hard to respond. And then they follow up with a bunch of drones that are armed with say bombs and guns and then just you know kill them and destroy them or vice versa, you know, start out with a bunch of guns and bombs to sort of focus their attention. And so then they don't pay attention to the chemicals being uh, sprayed in the air around them that might uh, create significant harm. Um, so I think it's a very real concern there on the delivery system aspect. I think there are also defensive uh, aspects and Greg hit on, I think both of the ones I was planning on doing uh, around uh, forensics and plume modeling, as well as some of the uh, cleanup aspects. And I think drone swarm sort of escalates uh, that capability even further because what you get with drone swarms is sort of that mass aspect and coordination aspect where you have multiple drones working together to and coordinating around behaviors so rather than having say um, a single drone that's sort of searching an area looking for signs of uh, some chemical agent you get a whole bunch of them that are all operating together you maybe have some ground drones that are working with aerial drones and they're communicating and collaborating and um, breaking up how exactly they're searching over a particular area of concern or monitoring for these plumes or getting say different angles around um, different different data uh, on that plume so you get more precise uh, modeling of where that spread is. And that may even be integrated with say live sensors about the population in the in the likely direction of where that plume is headed. So, you know, hey, is there some uh, big group of people hanging out down uh, very clearly downwind? Um, so I think there's some very real applications um, that could be really interesting there to explore. On the nuclear side, um, I think, again, there are applications to both offense and defense. Uh, I think in, on this side, I think most of the relevance is on the deep, uh, more significant aspect is on the defensive side. So just to follow the same order, I'll start with offense again. So I think 
offense is l relatively limited here in drone swarms and it's more of sort of how the technology may enable existing technologies so you can imagine how uh, collaboration communication might be helpful for say like cruise missiles or other type of missiles to sort of um slight uh, change their targeting uh, depending on how um uh, yeah, how, depending on how, how they change it, whether heading towards a target. Um, already there's been uh, some work around communication between just regular types of bombs uh, to sort of better uh, improve their, their targeting. Uh, I'm a little bit skeptical about how significant that'll be for like nuclear weapons, just given the sheer size that like it doesn't seem as important to have very some of that uh, communication collaboration. But I think there's at least uh, potential there. Uh, but I think again, like where there's likely to be more significant aspects around the defensive um, challenge, particularly in targeting, uh, mobile, identifying targeting and destroying some of these uh, mobile delivery systems. Um, if we think about from a broader nuclear deterrence perspective, it's really important for states to have a uh, second strike deterrence where they can be assured that a uh, single detect, uh, single attack won't destroy their entire nuclear forces. So we have like submarines that hide in the vastness of the ocean. And we believe that, you know, even in the event of a major nuclear attack, they'll be survivable. So if you can better identify and target those systems, that tends to be uh, quite significant. Um, so what you can imagine with drone swarms is how you might use that same sort of collaboration widespread area searches to try to search for some of these vehicles, um, either on land or even at sea, um, developing and there's quite a lot of work going on about un building undersea uh, drone networks as well and un uh, undersea uh, vehicles, where they may say search, uh, search the ocean looking for sign signatures of submarines. Um, now I think realistically, given these vastness of the ocean, um, there's gonna be a lot of log major logistics challenges and only have have to be um, coupled extensively with you know intelligence, knowledge of adversary behaviors, doctrine, um, and very targeted to say you know focus your search areas around uh, like known uh, nuclear uh, or submarine ports and stuff like that, rather than just sort of searching the vast of the ocean. Um, but I think the potential for identifying these systems um, is very real. So it was a really fascinating in, uh, international security article the other day that looked at uh, submarine warfare in or actually yeah well it, it touched on it. The main topic was um, something slightly different, but it, it was talked extensively about uh, undersea competition and nuclear warfare during the Cold War. And they found that um, based on historical records during, I think it was like the 60s and 70s, uh, the United States had such an understanding of Soviet nuclear submarine forces that they actually at the time believed they could actually take out uh, all Soviet nuclear capabilities in a single strike um, because of particular aspects of how the uh, Soviet forces were sort of maneuvering their submarines where it ended up being somewhat predictable, um, particularly when coupled with various uh, sensor systems that were placed um, in various aspects of the ocean. Um, so it's certainly possible to imagine that, you know, enhancing that capability to having these broad sensor networks will sort of get that same sort of um, capability, sort of identify and find some of these um, uh, nuclear systems in conjunction with, you know, intelligence and doctrine and all these other aspects of it that are important too. So in terms of, okay, so given all this application, like what do we do about that? Um, I think there's a few things um, important to hit on. So first, I think perhaps most importantly is red teaming and assessing adversary tactics and strategies. Think, uh, you know, thinking imaginatively about, you know, how might uh, states and non-state actors as well. But again, I think that's less of a risk, but how might folks uh, employ these in novel ways and how might these different ideas stack up? Like how big of a deal is it uh, if you have some of these big networks uh, of, of drones searching across the ocean, or how, how, how big of a deal is it if you have these mixed chemical and biological delivery systems? And we need to, I think, explore and figure out which of these are really, you know, are nice to think about, um, but may not really be that big of a deal, and which of these like, oh, we need to really worry about this and develop some uh, defensive measures. Um, I think there's a need to sort of think about how we defend some of these nuclear delivery systems um, in new and novel ways. Uh, particularly, I think, you know, the role of decoys and disguise, I think, are particularly important. Um, as we saw in the conflict uh, in Armenia and Azerbaijan, um, part of the, what makes these drones significant is sort of that loitering case of capability where they can sort of just sit and watch for uh, movement of some particular um, vehicle and then just destroy it as needed. So drones, in that case, destroyed a whole bunch of, like, tanks and armored personnel characters and all, all other types of things. And so one of the answers to that is sort of to better disguise these systems and, uh, you know, deploy, like, as you can see, this sort of what looks like just sort of a blow up model of a little nuclear um, uh, nuclear system there. Um, but exactly what that looks like, I think it'll be interesting. So I think there's probably also a need to develop potentially even unmanned versions of some of these systems that may not necessarily be nuclear armed, but look like them. Because as we improve like image recognition and uh, higher resolution images, some of these decoys may very well show up as you know more likely to be decoys. Um, but nonetheless, I think there's just exploring some of these options is I think important. And finally, and I think this will 
tailor up nicely to uh, our final presentation, Nicole, I think there's a need to think about um, counter UAS and integrating that within the counter WMD space. Because if we think about uh, stop detecting and stopping a drone swarm armed with a bunch of chemical, biological, radiological uh, agents, that's really not all that different from detecting any type of um, dr uh, any type of um, drone. There may be some slight differences in terms of like, you know, because a chemical drone probably has some big like canister that might be recognized, but really much of the challenge is the same. So I think there's a need to work uh, together with all the different departments working on CUS as well as interest in the CWMB aspect of it um, to think about like what what lessons learned have they found, uh, what types of technology seems to be working better or worse, and how you can go about uh, addressing the strategies. But to sum up, um, overall, I think there are some extremely broad applications uh, for this technology, and I think this technology is here now. And so there's very real need to think carefully about what this means and figure out our best, best solutions to reduce the risk and hopefully develop some better defenses. Thank you. Over to you, Nicole. Great, thank you. Let me see if I can um, share my screen here. Oh, it says host has disabled sharing screen. That's okay, I only had one slide, it's fine. Um, hello, my name is uh, Nicole Thomas and I am the division chief for uh, strategy and policy and the joint counter UAS office. So um, both Greg and Zach talked a lot about CBER and the implications of drones and swarm technology. And I'm gonna briefly cover what the Department of Defense's approach is to addressing the potential threats and hazards from small UAS in general. So we recognize that the threat is quickly evolving. So in 2019, the Secretary of Defense designated the Army to be the executive agent for counter small UAS. And so to execute that designation, the Secretary of the Army set up the Joint Counter UAS Office, or the JCO, which is where I work. And our role is to synchronize counter UAS efforts across the DOD. One of the first big things the JCO did was to complete an operational assessment of the equipment we have already fielded. You know, over the past couple of years, we fielded a lot of systems. And this assessment allowed us to kind of step back and uh, pare down uh, our systems to a few interim solutions in different categories like fixed, mobile, and command and control. Um, we also developed an operational requirements document that helps us focus uh, our future investments on very specific capabilities. The other big thing that we did in the JCO was to produce the DOD's first counter UAS strategy, and that's what my division was responsible for doing. So as we were thinking through how to characterize the problem, we used a few key trends to help um, frame the central challenge that we thought the department was facing. One is first, obviously, is the exponential growth of this sector, the expanding capability of these systems and its affordability are enabling an even more diverse set of actors to have access to the air domain. And quite frankly, um, that's something that was previously only um, had, uh, for state actors. And so now we have a variety of people who can do this. The second is the increasing numbers of ways in which these systems can be used for nefarious means as with Greg and Zach uh, pointed out. And third uh, is the growing commercial and private use of small UAS which is um, driving us to make it increasingly important that we have the capability and the training to detect and identify what's flying near and above our operations. So if you take a look at the strategy, which is posted on the DOD website, um, you know, we found a couple of things. One, you know, we're doing a pretty good job of developing and deploying material and, and sending it down range to contingency locations when needed. But our desire to be really responsive created a, a gap in training. So one of the things the department intends to do is to synchronize our solutions to ensure that the policies and the training we provide support the material we're developing. Second, we realize that the joint force must be more agile in responding to emerging threats. So that will require us to look at our processes and find ways to get after those threats faster. And finally, 
Um, our interagency partners and international ally, sorry, our interagency partners and international allies and partners around the world are our key, key enablers for the strategy. So we dedicate a, a line of effort that, um, that drives us to improve how we integrate and how we become interoperable um, with them. So in the end, we want to give commanders and the joint force what they need to defend our facilities and personnel and missions. So given the complexity of the problem, we need to pull in a more diverse community to provide their unique perspective on this mission set. So partnering with academia and research labs and, and finding new ways to work with industry will be one of the ways we'll be able to remain agile and stay ahead of the threat. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nicole. And we caught up a little bit on time. That was very succinct <laughs> and I appreciate it. And sorry, you didn't get to uh, share your slide, but if you want to no. pull it up, uh, you're most welcome. So we've got some terrific questions. And because I think there's just a lot of technical knowledge in this group, uh, I'm going to just go directly to the questions and hope I won't garble them because some of them are um, uh, more technical than I, I might understand. So let's see, let's get started. What do you see as the future application of collaborative smart tools like facial recognition uh, to run against a terrorist use of drones? Would this type of collaboration be useful when countering the CBRN deployments? Um, because presuming that there has to be proximity to controlling the use of the drones. Anybody want to grab that one? I think there would probably be limited uh, utility for that kind of approach, just because one of the advantages of uh, UAVs is that they can be remotely operated, and it depends on the, on the model. But but the individual, especially if there's an onboard camera they can use for guidance, could be you know several miles away. And if the drones are relying purely on GPS guidance, they might be completely autonomous, and therefore there won't be anyone uh, operating them at at the time. So there might be kind of other counterterrorism applications for coupling facial recognition and, and drones, but in the CBRN space, I don't, I don't particularly see it um, as being a, a, a leading um, defensive measure. So Greg, you may have partially answered the next question. How are terrorists controlling the drones? Is there an argument for kind of regular signal disruption uh, to prevent the approach of such drones as part of a perimeter of defense, say at a nuclear facility? <coughs> Zach, do you have, want to come in on that one? Yeah, I can comment a little bit on that. Um, so I think there has been a, a little bit of work on that. So there, uh, there's been a big focus on like geofencing. That is like the ability, like so within many of these drones, they have these inbuilt uh, GPS systems. And when they hit a particular lo sense of location, the idea is like, okay, they just sort of stop uh, like operating. Um, and there has been some work on that uh, for some of these sensitive uh, facilities. However, it also looks like there's all, uh, already like available <laughs> countermeasures um, just available online and how to like get around that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So we have a question on Iraq and one on Iran. Let me just put them together. Um, do you think that the uh, militia forces in Iraq, the Shia-backed militias, uh, the Iranian-backed militias, are likely to be increasing their uh, use of drones? Um, the U.S. military is developing drone defense measures, but um, whether they've already started to see any engagement with forces in Iraq and a second question of a report that uh, intercepted communications out of Iran said that there was a drone attack in DC. Uh, do we know, and does anybody know anything about drones that Iran uh, threatened to DC with? Anybody see, familiar no, with I, either of those? I, I have not heard anything about that. But. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll comment on the general Iraq and Iran um, issue. I know, I believe it was General McKinsey uh, over at CENTCOM had comment, has commented a few times um, in news media about how very concerned he is about drone use about uh, against forces. Um, I can't remember the exact language, but I believe it was basically, we're getting straight outgunned. Um, I might be misremembering, but that was the basic gist of it. Like we're there, this is a major problem. Um, and he was particularly concerned about like, as, as we're getting like swarming and multiple drones coming together is a huge problem. Mm -hmm. But not necessarily with any uh, WMD on it? Uh, no, not necessarily. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and no, I think we're also. Let's go ahead, Nicole. Oh, nothing. It just I was going to piggyback on what he said. Yes, General McKenzie said that um, drones are very concerning. Um, they're uh, the most concerning thing since the IED, and that's that's mm -hmm. pretty significant. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Iran's been a lot of experience um, 
with uh, these kinds of tactics by supporting the, the Houthi rebels and, and some of their attacks on, on Saudi Arabia. Um, so I, I would not be surprised if uh, Iran exports some of those tactics to the other proxy groups they support in, in Iraq and Syria and, and Lebanon and, and elsewhere. So whatever is demonstrated and, and proven to be useful in one field of, of engagement, I think we should expect it to see to, to pop up in other areas as well. But so far, and, we've yes. seen drones as, as for surveillance purposes. Have we seen them heavily weaponized, causing any casualties? In, in Yemen, yes, but in uh, Iran or Iraq? Uh, I believe so. I'm not aware of uh, specifics, but I know uh, ISIS, for example, used, I think, 300 uh, drone operations during the Battle of Mosul. And I know at least uh, quite a few of those were uh, directly armed. Mm -hmm. uh, Nicole? Uh, no, I was just going to uh, comment on something Greg said earlier about uh, replicating tactics and the, the recent uh, conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia is, is a good way. Um, People are be, are studying this that, that fight uh, because it had such uh, novel things going on in it. So it's another example of things that are happening that are going to replicate across. Good. Uh, this may be for Nicole, and I don't know whether you can uh, answer this. Is DOD working on a miniature rail gun that can be integrated into a UAV? I personally am not aware of that. Doesn't mean it's not happening. I just don't know about that. Mm -hmm. Next question is, uh, much of the UAV, UGV technology requires advanced data analytics and real-time processing to be truly effective. The same is true in order to truly defeat them. Could you comment on the critical requirement for application of AI, machine learning, advanced data analytics and processing to enable timely informed decision-making and enhance situational awareness to defeat and defend against these threats? Great, thank you. So yeah, that, that's definitely important. So what we have, I talked about in my, in my earlier comments was we have the operational capabilities requirements document, which is a mouthful, but it basically kind of lays out the things that we need industry to help us build future capabilities. So we're looking at AI, automation, machine learning. Those are things that are gonna kind of help us um, get after the threat and, and close some of those gaps. Great. Um, but um, one of the also things that we're doing is we're trying to develop a, a joint common C2 called the JAT C2, and that's going to enable us to pull in that information. So we, as we have AI and automation and machine learning, it's going to pull in a lot of data. And that's the, this, the common C2 is going to allow us not only to have a better site picture, but it's going to rationalize all of that data that's coming in so that the operator can make better decisions and process that information that's coming in. It will actually decrease the burden and stress on the operator who actually has to make sense of what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, from um, someone at the CBRN Academy, what are the required control measures that need to be applied to prevent CBRN drone attacks? Well, I think this is one of the real dilemmas we face is because there's such a proliferation of drones for civilian and commercial purposes that could be either misused or, or modified for misuse. Um, it, it, that's that's going to be a real that's going to be a real challenge. I mean, Zach mentioned geofencing, uh, and there might be some other kind of built-in features, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, that will be those will be vulnerable to to hacking or otherwise um, circumventing. So, um, you know, threats at the low end from you know, commercially available systems will definitely be harder to counter than some of the more high end threats that Zach was talking about that involve, you know, swarms and, you know, highly, you know, integrated uh, systems. Uh, and so at some point, you have to focus more on, on the bottleneck, which might be the, the CBR and agents themselves, not the drones as delivery systems. Um, so again, this is a, just to reinforce Zach's point before about the, the need for the counter UAS and the, and the counter WMD um, communities to work more closely together to figure out where are the right bottlenecks uh, and where are the places we should emphasize, um, uh, you know, um, uh, joint efforts to try and, and reduce some of those kinds of threats. I think that will be an important area moving forward. Mm -hmm. Next. Uh, will FAD eventually be replaced by drone swarms or possibly used in conjunction? Do you see drone swarms being integrated at that level, Zach? 
Um, I think there's potential to integrate. I would be skeptical about like fully replacing it, just given the like size of the uh, relative missiles. Um, I don't know enough about that system to comment for sure, but I think certainly looking at how drone swarms can integrate and support uh, outer missile defense is definitely a good good thing to do. I think it would make sense to integrate them if you look and see what Russia is doing. Um, they took a lot of lessons from their foray in, U in Ukraine and Syria, and they are integrating drones um, at every level and across all their services. And that's something we want to probably consider as well. Interesting. Uh, so commercial applications for swarms include displays and alternatives to fireworks. Will this accelerate the hostile use of swarms? Uh, I don't think the probably won't accelerate the hostile use, but certainly the broader like awareness um, that this technology is out there. And may, I could imagine it creating some sort of challenges from responses in terms of like, okay, this person is buying a whole bunch of drones. Are they doing it for, you know, display purposes or commercial applications, or is this potentially trying to, you know, some, do something hostile? Great. Thanks. Uh, from Larry Pfeiffer, what are the greatest intelligence challenges and gaps that need to be addressed in the counter UAS domain? Is the Intel community making this a priority? Uh, yes, actually, um, I, um, I co-chair um, the, uh, the Threat Intelligence Working Group. And one of the things that we're doing is uh, we're really improving, like I said in my earlier comments, that connective tissue between the intelligence and threat assessments and the capability that we are uh, we are developing. So um, we're trying to make better use of that. And actually we're, we're, uh, we're doing a, a TTX to kind of further explore that. So that's definitely something that's gonna be very critical if we're gonna get after some of these gaps. Uh, we also have a process that's called the Joint, Joint Counter UAS Strategic Portfolios Review. And um, that, that, that basically takes the um, threat assessments, it looks at studies and a analysis, and it looks at what, of our, what our capability gaps are, and then we uh, decide what we're going to resource based on those gaps. So again, the intelligence assessments play a huge role in future capability development. Great. Uh, Nicole, the next one is for you. So um, keep, your, keep your mic open if you can. <laughs> um, uh, could you expand on the required training that you brought? Uh, who would be trained and what type of training? Can you say more about that? Yeah, so one of the things that we're doing, as I said in the comments, that we kind of pared down um, those systems to a few. And then the idea is that we're going to move into some joint capability. Because before, there was lots of systems out there and services had very service-specific systems. Um, but the training was um, inconsistent. And so what we're doing is we are pairing those systems down, we're having joint capability, and with that we'll have joint training. So we're doing, on, we're, we are developing online training and they're in the testing phase now. Um, we are going to have uh, institutional training. So a joint academy, I'm not sure what they're actually gonna call it, but it's gonna be a way in which all the services will have a common level of training so that you don't have that inconsistency. Mm, great. Uh, is there any unclassified information that the UA, uh, into the UAAP reported by the USS Kidd off the coast of California? Anybody hear about that one? Okay, let's, why don't we move on? Um, so um, somebody's asking, uh, Nicole, could you post the reference to the publicly available document on the strategy? Uh, if you want to maybe tell people how to find it on the DOD website, I don't know, um, someone would like to use it. Sure, um, absolutely. It's on the, um, the DOD website and there's a list of documents and all the documents that um, DOD has published for this year or last year are, are right there. Or if you simply just really Google counter UAS DOD strategy, it'll pop right up. Thanks. Uh, in what ways are we preparing for agricultural bioterrorism? In your opinion, what should be done next? Reduced biodiversity in US agriculture, in some large swaths, we are essentially monoculture is very worrying. Uh, Greg, that looks like it's up your alley. Sure. So, um, yeah, I mean, so there's, there's, there's been a, a, you know, a long time concern about um, agricultural bioterrorism, um, but we have actually seen, you know, any groups really interested in pursuing that um, that that type of threat? This this case in China that I mentioned is is one of the, the few cases we know of uh, you know intentional deliberate attempt to to spread a an animal pathogen. Um, uh, you know, 
and, and unfortunately, our, our, our agricultural system is just, it is very vulnerable in the sense it's very, it's very open, it's very large, it's very spread out. Uh, the one uh, advantage we have, though, is that because the system is so large, um, you know, any, any attack will likely have a local impact, but is unlikely to um, be able to spread to become, uh, you know, something that can infect the entire, you know, cattle population or, or the entire, you know, wheat crop, um, just because it is, it is such a, a large and, and widely dispersed um, you know, agricultural system. Um, uh, and, and at this point, you know, the, the focus has been mostly on controlling the pathogens that are of, of most um, concern. Uh, but the, the problem is, as demonstrated by the, the case in, in China, is that a lot of these diseases that we worry about in the U.S. that are not, don't exist naturally here, are endemic in other parts of the world. And so transporting those types of agents into the U.S. would not be that, that difficult. Um, animal plant pathogens are easier to disseminate than ones uh, that are aimed uh, at, at humans because you don't need to necessarily aerosolize animal and plant pathogens into the very small particle size to, in, to infect humans. Um, but um, you know, the, the key then becomes, you know, if you can't bring a, lo a, a small scale local attack, the key then is early detection and then containment of the disease in that animal population or that, pam that plant population. So really the emphasis should be on um, biosurveillance by veterinarians and um, farmers and, and plant pathologists to make sure that we identify any kind of outbreak early on and respond as quickly as possible to, to contain and prevent it from spreading. Um, so I think at this point, that would be the area where I would emphasize more investments in terms of, of biosurveillance for both animal and plant disease outbreaks. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody's asking if there's any database, either academic or official, that is tracking drone incidents. Um, does anybody, is anybody aware of a, a publicly available data collection that, uh, like we have on terrorism incidents? Is there... Uh -oh. Uh, I was going to say yes, but then you said public. No, we don't. There's no publicly available one that I'm aware of. <laughs> yeah, like uh, I've seen. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, mm, uh, please. I've seen. Um, I think there was one published study that did collect a bunch, uh, like all of them, on um, non-state actor use. But I'm not aware that it's kept live. Um, probably there's also some uh, under the Global Terrorism Database. I, I'm sure they're capturing drone incidents, but I don't, I'm not aware that they like specifically flag like this is a drone versus other type of incident. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to combine two questions. A few years back, there was just a lot of concern about the ethics of the use of drones, that changing the nature of warfare with the threat not equally distributed, you know, among the adversaries and whether, uh, and even the psychological stress on people who were managing drones in the U.S. military. So have, do any of you work on the sort of human dimension of drone policy and public attitudes towards drones. Um, maybe this is outside the parameters of today's conversation, but if anybody has something to add, that would be great. Yeah, so I think there needs to be focus on that. So um, I'm generally a believer that drone swarms, not necessarily WMD armed, but could very well just be a WMD in and of themselves, which is a you know much larger discussion. Um, and I think it's important to bring up uh, many of these concerns, particularly given these proliferation risks. I think uh, like trying to put major treaties and norms in place in a quick way isn't going to happen unless there's pretty broad negative views that like, hey, this is something we need to worry about. So I think that's definitely an important aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Greg, you mentioned that storage tanks at chemical plants are considered hard targets uh, for attack. How vulnerable to UAS attacks are the rest of the chemical facilities, pipelines, valves, uh, corrugated steel warehouses, et cetera? So do you, could you speak a little bit more about um, chemical plants? Sure. Um, so e either I misspoke or I was misheard because I don't, I don't think those storage containers actually are hard targets, uh, especially if uh, you have uh, a, a malicious actor that has access to um, shaped charge projectiles or, or anything that is able to, to um, have an armor piercing capability uh, to it. And those are very large um, you know, uh, tanks that are, that are usually exposed uh, from, from above very uh, openly as opposed to there being better uh, defenses on the ground to prevent unauthorized access to a, to a facility. Um, and those would be probably easier to target than, than pipelines, other things that are just smaller um, targets. Uh, but I think this is, an example of an area where um, chemical security, you know, nuclear security in the US, um, if they haven't grappled with the UAS threat the way that DOD has, then we will have lots of vulnerabilities that people are just not thinking about. Uh, and this goes back to Zach's point about the importance of red teaming. So DHS has chemical security, uh, chemical facility security standards. Um, I haven't checked lately. I don't know they've been updated to deal with you know, possible threats from, from above as opposed to traditional terrestrial assaults. Same thing with nuclear power plants that have a design basis threat that is, last I heard was updated you know, about 10 years ago. 
So it probably does not include uh, groups that have inside knowledge about a facility due to drones or using uh, drones as flying IEDs to disrupt defenses or, or target you know, backup systems at a, at a nuke facility. So this is the kind of thing I think that, that facilities and government agencies in charge of security need to be looking at and thinking about and then figure out how do we then increase awareness and, and update policies, procedures, and defensive measures in order to have a layer of defense against this new type of threat that's emerging. Yeah, thank you. So we've really made good progress. We've gone through most of the questions. I thought uh, just in the interest of time, I'll throw out one more for any, and then a final, uh, if any of the, our speakers wanna just make any final point. Uh, so the last question will be on resources and how do, how do governments get ready from a financial resources and budget perspective? Uh, to prepare countermeasures. So drones are inexpensive, but countermeasures devices are very expensive. For law enforcement and defense, um, how do you, do you anticipate that the drone technology is going to become a more important driver of budget decisions and, and the competition for resources uh, in, our, in our both federal and maybe state level budgets? Anybody want to comment? I, I don't know that drone technology is going to be driving those budget decisions, but definitely um, the cost curve is upside down, right? You, drones are very inexpensive. Countermeasures are incredibly expensive. Um, but we um, have to have sort of an innovative approach to it. And um, since we were talking about swarms, I wanted to talk about what the Department of Defense is doing for swarms. And um, that kind of ties into the budget piece. And that is um, the Department of Defense is... Uh, program is called THOR. It's Tactical uh, High-Powered Microwave Operational Responder. And by the title, you know, it's a high-powered microwave. And um, it's a kind of, the THOR story is kind of a perfect example of, it kind of encapsulates what the Department of Defense in general with our approaches for counter UAS. You know, the department had a, a specific issue and that was a potential for swarms. And so they needed to get um, some capability out there quickly. And as you know, the, the uh, process for capability development from development, to, uh, testing to fielding is years. And quite frankly, we don't have that kind of time. So the folks that developed Thor did it in 18 months and that is very fast. Um, and they did it fairly inexpensively. So that was $15 million. So that's a way in which we can be innovative and be quick. Um, and, and be um, relatively inexpensive. Um, the Thor does a couple other things as well. We are putting a couple, um, a few um, more resources against that program in the next couple of years. And one of the things they want to do is um, create an exportable version of that. And that's really a big deal. As I said in my earlier statements that our partners and allies are really key to our security overseas. And they often buy our capability, but there's a long lead time to getting it because we have to work through re releasability and uh, for making that uh, an item that is exportable. For, with Thor, they're doing that on the front end. So as soon as that uh, equipment is ready, they can go out the door. You don't have that long lead time. So I think um, Thor is kind of kind of cracked the code uh, on how to, you know, do things fast, do things inexpensively, and get it out there to the field and, and support our allies and partners. Great, thank you, Nicole. Uh, mm -hmm. Greg and Zach, any final thoughts and we'll wrap up. Yeah, I was just gonna add um, on to uh, Nicole's comment from like a Homeland's uh, perspective, I think there's also a need to rethink some of like the particular authorities and how we uh, address counter UAS, particularly where um, at the moment, only a handful of federal authorities are allowed to operate uh, counter UAS systems. Um, but you know, many of these threats are to uh, private sector facilities. So how do you, I think there's a need to think about how you balance that. Um, personally, the one that I like and have put out is uh, like teleoperated drone systems, uh, counter drone systems operated by federal uh, authorities that are then dispersed to various facilities. Uh, but even if that's not the best approach, um, that's definitely a key issue I think that needs to be addressed to you know, reduce the threat. Thanks. Uh, Greg? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, mean, I just want to highlight that this is just another one of those areas where you have emerging technologies, national security, homeland security, and public policy all intersecting in, in a really interesting way. And, and um, it, it's, it's nice to hear what, what DOD is, is doing uh, on the threat. Um, but uh, unfortunately, as, as Zach and I have highlighted, right, that threat keeps evolving and emerging. So um, I think we, this is a dynamic 
threat and, and we're going to need a dynamic process to keep evaluating it and trying to develop countermeasures to, to stay ahead of it. So I think this is just going to be an enduring challenge we're just going to have to be grappling with for the next several years. Right. Thank you, Greg. A very perfect way to end. Uh, greatest thanks to Nicole Thomas for joining us. Zach Kellerboard, terrific presentation. Greg, thank you so much. Thanks to everybody who tuned in and do check csps.gmu.edu from time to time for upcoming programs. So uh, thanks everybody and we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.